In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of one way that I practice my software testing, which combines um, software testing, learning JavaScript and programming and uh, automating from a tactical perspective. Now, I assume you practice your testing. And by practice, I mean deliberately doing something and deliberately spending time and going outside your normal comfort zone as you test. So when you practice your testing, you're not picking up an application and going, right, where are the requirements? Now I'll write some test cases. You can do that to practice test techniques. You can analyze things, but you clearly don't need the requirements. Just pick an application, look at it, analyze it. Go, how would I test this? What would I need in order to test this? Start thinking through um, the testability aspects. Do I have the ability to test this? Do I know how to test this? What information would I need? Do I have the environments? All that kind of stuff in the, the testability type approach and get your, your mindset on. But one of the things I do is because I like playing games and I don't have a lot of time to play games, um, I pick games on the internet like Z-Type, X-Type, there's a whole bunch of different games. Um, and then I will look at them and try and figure out how to test it. Now, the reason I do this Right, so back in the olden days, when we were growing up, there was this Cascade 50 tape, which had 50 games, you bought it once, 50 games, it came with a free watch, and pretty universally, um, the free watch is viewed as the best part of this package, because the games were um, dreadful. Right, there's a lot, a lot of games in here, and they were really bad, like really bad graphics, really bad um, programming, they were pretty much written in um, basic, so they weren't fast, they weren't good. It was just kind of knock some stuff out and throw it out there. Problem is, I really liked this. And I really liked it because I could play the game, which was fine. It wasn't very good, but it kept me busy for a little bit of time. But I could break into it and I could see the code. Right, so here is one of the uh, ZX81 games from the Cassette 50. This is called Maze Eater. I'm going to do level one. And this game is pretty rubbish. I the, I'm the little circle, I move about and I eat the dots. That's it. Um, not a lot of challenge there. But the best bit is, as you can see down here, if I hit the space key and do break, and then I use the K key to get list, I can see the code, right? All the code is there. So when we've loaded up the game, the code is there. Now this is analogous to what we have now with the web. When I come in, I load up a game, in here is all the code. I can do view page source. There's all the code for the game. This is exactly the same situation as we were back in the 80s when we were learning how to program. This is what kick-started the 80s um, software development in uh, the UK. We have all this in our console. So this is what I use to practice. And the side effect is, I end up doing this by finding a game or an application I'll play the game to figure out what's going on, to model the game and understand it, and I'll eventually get to the point where I write in bots to automate it, which is great, right? So then I'm challenging myself to play the game. There's a fun game that I can play, and I've written something that helps me understand JavaScript, and is me thinking about how can I tactically automate this to solve some problems. Now, last night I was, or yesterday I was working on X-Type, I found X-Type, I was playing this. Great game, you play this, you shoot things, you have to move about and shoot things. It's quite hard, but I wrote a little bot to automate this. And the bot completely plays the game. So it moves about, it shoots the things, it can get a much better score than I have. This was really challenging for me because I had to write code to um, move away from the bullets and adapt to it. It's not AI, it's a very crude, um, algorithm. It's not even a computer science algorithm out of book. It's just me knocking up, well, if this, then this, if this, which is exactly the type of coding that I did when I was learning how to code. There's not a lot of code structure in here, but it's tactical and it does the job. And very often when we're learning how to code and do programming, tactical stuff that does the job is good enough. It supports us. We're writing um, little utilities, little code, to help us get a job done. So that for me is, is one of the, the strengths here. Now, when I'm looking at these games, what I have to do is I have to play the game to figure out how it works. This, by the way, is, is my game. Um, this is as close as I will ever get to um, the 
uh, X type game. If I run this, you can see, oh look, there's things and I have to shoot them with the mouse key. Brilliant. Um, I can't move about in here, right? Because I didn't, I didn't code that into the game. But one of the things I can do when I've got the, the ability to hack the game is I have the ability to add extra code. I just wrote some code, injected it in here that allows me to move about. The original game didn't let me do that. So I, when I'm looking at games and apps online, I'm looking at what would be challenging here? What can I do to augment this? I don't have to write the entire game. I can make it play slightly differently. And to do that, I have to open up the code. I have to understand the JavaScript. I have to learn basic amounts of JavaScript in order to uh, do this work. And a lot of it comes down to very simple code that just um, uses set interval to um, call code on the fly. You can see some examples of this in the associated blog post for this video. But as I'm approaching it, I have to look at this game and go, how does this game work? So I'll look at the network tab, I'll run the game. Because this disable cache is here, it forces everything to load. So I'll see all the assets that are loaded. I can see that this game just has one file, which means that if I view the source, I will see the source code for this game. I can't manipulate it there, but I can read this. I can see, oh look, there's levels. I can go into the game in the console. I can go, right, show me your levels. I can see all the levels in the console. Because this is in the console, I could change these levels. I could go levels, it's an array, zero dot starts at, um, I could make that a uh, hundred. I don't even know what that does because I've forgotten how this works. Um, but I, the, the game is manipulatable to me. Right? I can interrogate it in the source. I can interrogate it through the sources tab. I can put breakpoints on here, stop it as we go through. Now what this does is as a tester, this forces my mind to realize everything that is in the front end cannot be trusted. Right? The GUI in our apps is not a trusted part of the architecture anymore because we as users can manipulate it. All the tools we need to manipulate these apps are in the browser. All the dev tools that the developers use to build it are in the browser. They are available to the users. We don't have to install SDKs anymore. It's all there, which forces us as testers to build our technical skills so that we're not just testing at the surface layer of the application because that needs to work. We need to test that. We need to functionally exercise that, go through the flows, try and do flows that it's not supposed to do. But if we limit ourselves there, we are aware if we've been practicing that we know we have to go further. We have to start introducing proxy tools to help us bypass the GUI and test at the server layer to make sure that the server is actually working because the GUI is not a trusted component because we can change any of this. Now, when I am starting with these games, and I am looking at them. I'll do this kind of approach. I'll load up the game. I'll look at the source and I'll do little experiments. And very often I'm not building games to bots to completely play the game. Like the Z type and X type bots are um, one of the few exceptions that I've got that play the entire game. Normally I'm writing support tools. So this is a remake of uh, 3D Monster Maze on the ZX81. One of the best things about this game when it came out originally was that on the cassette inlay, there were instructions to the user that when the game loaded, you didn't just type run. If you wanted to make the game faster, you typed in this little bit of code to change some of the variables in the game to make it run faster, right? The game came with instructions in how to hack it to make it faster. That was encouraged <laughs> back in those days. So with this game, this is a really good um, remake. Um, if I do continue here, what we've got is we've got a, a maze. It's a very simple maze. Well, it's not a simple maze, it's a complicated maze. Let's start. And there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex in here. And I will walk around the maze. I don't know where the Tyrannosaurus Rex is. And I'm trying to find the exit. The exit is usually at the top somewhere, but I, you get lost very quickly because um, you're trying in your head to remember how the, the maze might work. Rex is hunting for me. I don't know where he is. Oh, that's a wall. Um, and I'm going around and I'll probably die very soon because, oh, is that the, because I'm looking for the X. I've got no idea where I am. I'm out, oh, 
There he is. So Rex has eaten me. But in order to help me with this game, what I did, and I've got this on slow, so that if anyone is like concerned about flashing images, hopefully this won't affect you. But I'm warning you now, um, the screen is going to flash a bit. Normally when I play it, the map that I'm going to show you comes up and goes away and comes up and goes away because it's easier to play. But I've got it on slow mode. So what I've got here is a heads up display for this game. So let me start the game again. 3D Monster Maze, show slow map. Now what happens is, as I play the game, because I've added extra code in here, I can see me, I'm down the bottom is the one. I can only move when the um, maze is up. So, so it's not super easy. There, I'm pointing in the right direction, let's go. If I can get to the end of there, then I can see that the Rex, is, which is marked by the T, I can see exactly where it is. Now this is a, it feels like a different game. Ah, am I gonna make it? I'm not gonna make it. He's gonna get me as soon as I get there. Ah, okay. It feels like a different game at that point because now I can see where he is at all times and it's a, it's a different set. Now it's an action game. Now it's exciting. Previously, it was a kind of strategy, tactical, tense um, horror game. Now it's just a, a full on action game because these little augmentations change the game and allow you to do experiments. Now I use this kind of stuff in my testing and I use this to um, extract data, create data and um, sometimes I'll just have snippets of code that change it slightly. Anything that helps me, sometimes I'll take snippets of code, put them into bookmarklets so I can run them as you do here. You saw I've got a list of bookmarklets here to help me when I'm playing the game and test it. They add extra features. The amount of options that this opens up and it's such an easy way to learn. So you're looking at the code that's in the game, you're seeing the code, you're uh, understanding basic JavaScript. I could take this JavaScript out and run it from the console directly. I can override, I can learn eventually to override all these functions and completely change how it works. But this is automating tactically. I would never put this into a continuous integration server. This is to support my work. That's a lot of the reasons why we automate um, software development engineer in test creates tools and utilities to support people when they're testing. It's not just about automating and continuous integration. That's really important. But we also have to do things to support our work. Now, when we start automating tactically, very often the code that we write, if we keep using it, will become more strategic. The code that for me here that has become more strategic has been put into bookmarklets. Right, it's no longer run from the snippets view. It's no longer copy and pasted from a text editor into the console. I formalized it into bookmarklets because I'm going to use it all the time. The code had to get better written as I did that because it got ever more strategic. The next step might be to put something into WebDriver, to call up the game, to inject the JavaScript that I've written using the JavaScript executor, to then call it through a more strategic tool to help me automate it with something like uh, X-Type. I might choose to take all the code that I've written and um, inject it through something like WebDriver, but not just inject the same code to have some genetic algorithms to work out whether I can create a better algorithm for playing the game. I might decide to hook some AI approaches in in order to generate the code to come through. We start opening up options in how we test. Now the side effects of doing this are, um, you learn more. And it's hard to really t say in advance exactly what you're gonna learn or exactly how you are gonna use this. All I'm trying to do here is encourage you that there's a lot of benefit in practicing your testing in a very deliberate way, going underneath the covers. You can learn very simple amounts of JavaScript to automate it. And if you do a search for hacking JavaScript games, some of my material will come up and it's very simple to work through. Um, I do cover some of this in the technical web testing 101 course and I cover some of this on the Patreon stuff as well. But if you just do a web search for um, evil tester JavaScript, evil tester hacking JavaScript, stuff like that, material will come up because I've done conference talks and tutorials on this. This is just an encouragement because the benefits that you will get out of this are just massive, right? And you're not just practicing your testing, you're going beyond what you normally do. You're using tools, you're using it in a safe environment. Sometimes what I also do, another way I'll use to practice my testing is to get involved in bug bounties. Sometimes I'll do security testing in those, but it's not just about security testing, it's about getting access to applications that are want you to test them. 
Now, if you find functional defects during those bug bounties, chances are no one will be interested. You won't be able to raise them. You won't get any money. You can email them to people. They will just ignore you. They won't get fixed. I'm just telling you now because that's what happens. But you might find security problems. You might get a bounty, right? And it's a good way to practice because you don't have to download the apps or go on to the virtual machine sites and download virtual machines that have got pre-installed apps. There are loads of ways to test this. Right. The easiest way, or one of the easy ways, is to go off and look at the testing app that I've got. But there's a bunch of testing apps that people have written that you can use to practice your testing. It's just when you do, go below the covers, learn the dev tools, start learning the technology, push yourself further. But the most important thing is to actually practice your testing.